everyone. Welcome to Show Me the Meaning, Wisecracks Movie Podcast. Show me the meaning! My name is Jared, and I'm joined here with the Show Me the Meaning crew. We got Ryan. What up, film fans? And Austin. Hey. And joining us from the This Movie Changed Me podcast on uh, from On Being Studios is Lily Percy. How are you doing, Lily? Good. Hi, everyone. Great What's to up, have you here. What's up, guys? Thanks for coming on. So today we are doing the 2005 movie directed by Judd Apatow starring Steve Carell, The 40-Year-Old Virgin. As always, let's go around and get some first impressions. Let's start with Ryan. Ryan, what do you remember about the first time you saw this movie and what was it like revisiting it? Well, I've I um the first time I saw it, I remember not really like kind of being like what am I missing here because it was a big smash hit and I kind of didn't really like it. Mm. You know, uh as give me some context. Long. How old were you? Okay, this was or 2004 like, that came 2005. out. 2005. 2005. Yeah, so I was a senior in high school. Okay. Right? And uh but I do remember being a big Judd Apatow fan, you know, so I was excited that he was directing a movie. Because I love like I love and freaks and geeks. and geeks. I loved heavyweights. Yeah. I loved Celtic Pride. All of his early stuff, and then uh, um, so then when Wait, it came was out, Celtic Pride with Daniel Stern, yeah, by chance? <laughs> and, oh and Dan Aykroyd. God. Oh my god! <laughs> Me and my I dad really that. liked that movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so anyway, I had high hopes, and yeah, no, uh, but but and then kind of over the years, I remember being disappointed the first time I saw it. Over the years, I kind of had it in this in my mind, like this is I really don't like the Judd Apatow style. Let's roll the camera for hours and just wing it and improv the lines because it comes off in the movie is that it, you can just tell that half the lines are just them kind of like their 10th take of the idea that came to their mind, you know? Mm. So I don't really like that style. However, ha having said that, this was definitely the, my funnest time to watch it because I had a lot of, like, I there's just jokes every, that come every about 20, 30 seconds. There's good characters. I love Paul Rudd in this movie. I love Jane Lynch in this movie. Yeah. Um, there's some awesome moments. So yeah, overall, I liked it more than I, I used to. Interesting. All right, let's go with Lily next. So the first time I saw it was I had graduated from college the year before, so I was 23 and I'd just moved to New York. And I remember going to see it in the theater. Similarly to Ryan, I loved Freaks and Geeks and all, all of Judd Apatow's work and was really excited about about watching it. I was also a huge Steve Carell fan. I had a big crush on him, so this was another motivation for me. <laughs> and I remember being so blown away by the fact that they balanced this character who was so vulnerable and kind and thoughtful with so many jokes, honestly, and just raw, raunchy humor. And that's just, that's kind of the heart of me is being raunchy and vulgar and <laughs> having these inappropriate jokes, but then also this lovely, thoughtful vulnerability. Oh, we're going to get um, along great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? And I honestly just related to him so much in dating. I've always been a disaster in dating and um, really at times was just like, I'm just going to give up. This is just not a good idea for me. And so watching his character kind of navigate that and then literally see him having given up for most of his life on on dating and sex, it was, it was really lovely for me as a woman to see a man go through that interesting what about you austin i mean i have no fucking clue the first time was when i saw this um i know that i in my memory if you would have asked me a week ago what do i think about 40 year old virgin i would have had positive attachments to it because i'm sure i would have loved it and what it's happened? funny and yeah i mean <laughs> exactly what happened from a week ago <laughs> he shaved his beard exactly i shaved my beard and i lost all my samson strength and i'm no longer a man and i can't deal with man jokes um <laughs> no i actually as weird as it sounds and i hate to be like the debbie downer but you got you guys have me on here because i'm like the critical theorist i'm supposed to be like the wanky douchebag that navel gazes, right? Absolutely. So sure. I'm gonna pl I'm gonna play that role right now. Um, We're about to get problematic, I, uh, aren't we? I'm about to get problematic, bro. <laughs> um, I haven't used that word in a few weeks, and I feel like the people are they're asking for it. I, I'm um, asking for it. Yeah. <laughs> I I had a hard time. I'd say for the first 30 or 40 minutes getting into this film because of so much attention that's been going on around like MGTOW and men rights activists and uh, incels and things like that. So for me, it was really tough to like separate the cultural conversation that's going on with the way that a that, that this guy who's oftentimes kind of taken in a, in a particular direction within this like online subculture that now has manifested itself in a couple of um, public displays of violence it was hard for me to like get that 
and I know it's not the same thing. I know Steve Carell is not an incel. Like he's kind of more like he's given up on love. He'd be like the shy love version of this subset of this subculture. But I couldn't separate myself from that cultural context. So I actually had like a really difficult time watching this film, even though I still laughed my ass off during like the condom scene and and things like that. Like there are parts, you know, obviously when he's improvising, getting his chest and ripped out and shit like that. Because you know <laughs> that that whole thing was improvised. Yeah. And you can see the dudes just fucking cracking up, right? Yeah. Um, awesome. For the people at home, what's an incel? Yeah. So it's short for um, involuntary celibate. And gotcha. which is actually a really kind of terrible term because it makes it seem like you're a victim or something like that. But it's a group of online individuals who have kind of um, been lurking around like Reddit and 4chan and things like that, who are basically dudes who feel that women have ostracized them because they're nerdy or because they don't conform to certain standards of uh, norms of beauty. And so there's this kind of like um, circular self-referential hatred that's been building within these communities and it's led to a couple of outbursts of anger most recently they believe um the attack in toronto where the the man uh drove a van and killed 10 people injuring i think 13 or 14 others uh he posted something on facebook um glorifying this guy named elliot roger who you guys might remember was the isla vista killer who uh made that post called like Elliot Rogers retribution on YouTube yeah, where he that. talks about how he's been spurned by women and he was going to get his retribution and kill them because they weren't giving them his sex and uh, his, the, the love that he thought that he deserved. So I couldn't quite get this weird perverse desire for sex that the film sort of like manifests as a whole out of my mind. And then also this, this kind of like nerdy shy, love shy kind of guy who's, this 40 year old celibate guy out of my mind and separate that from the culture. And I know it's not the same thing, but I had a tough time watching it because of that. <clears throat> this may surprise you, but uh, in my notes, I have incel written down. <laughs> I, uh, wow. It actually made me think about that as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But we'll get to that. Uh, so the first time I saw this movie, I was a junior in high school and I thought it was hilarious. I had no idea who Judd Apatow was. I had not seen Freaks and Geeks, but <clears throat> This was the first time that I had experienced, you know, the Judd Apatow. I mean, it was the first time anyone had really experienced the improvisational nature of comedy that he then for the next decade and a half will come to own basically all studio comedy. <laughs> this was the beginning of it. And, you know, in my youth, I was exactly the target audience and I bought in hardcore. <laughs> this time watching it, I, similar to Austin, I was a little bit critical. But, you know, see, the difference <laughs> between me and Austin is that, like, when these things enter my mind, I... I, I'm like I'm like pissed off. I'm like no, like it's it's like we have this panoptic ideology that is like it, it has like ruined me. Like I can't enjoy a movie anymore. I can't enjoy mm -hmm. jokes anymore. Not even because I agree with some of the things. Like I don't think that this movie is problematic at the end of the day, but that voice, that cultural voice that would deem it so, I can't get away from, and it's killing me. You know, <laughs> it's killing me. It's destroying everything. But I, I'm actually glad that you brought that up, Austin, because I think it's going to lead to a pretty interesting conversation. The only mm -hmm. scene that I thought really fit that category uh, was the was the them playing video games and the oh you're gay because you did this scene. You know, uh, right? really? really just kind of like I mean, yeah, it's more I mean, just because none of the jokes were funny. It's like you know, if you land the jokes, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you know how I know you're well. gay. Yeah, it's funny uh, that we share our office with a director who's worked on SNL and stuff, and he's making a movie right now. And uh, I told him, hey, I just watched Forty old version he goes oh haha ha. you know how i know you're gay and, he, and then he just stopped and said and then he just stopped and said there's no way you can get away with that today and, right. and like and that's yeah. no, that's nothing unique to this film i feel like you watch any like it just culture has accelerated so much that you go back even four years and you're going to see that in comedy so it's not it's not something particularly unique to this film but yeah um so interestingly before i go into the recap i want to bring up a term that Excuse me, one of our fans emailed us. His name is Michael, and he studies at George Mason. I'm actually curious if any of you guys are familiar with this Greek term, kairos, K-I-R-O-S. Have you heard of that, Austin? Yeah, I mean, I wrote about it quite a bit in uh, in a piece that I'm trying to publish right now. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a Greek word for time, but it's yes. different from chronos um, or ion, which is understood more as eternity. Chronos is what we think is chronological time. Kairos means like a either like the time to act or the opportune moment. So, and um, it, it means like an age, like a particular age. And, it, and it, it's an age, but it's an age in which it's the opportune moment to act. You can't not act. So it comes out of rhetoric and things like that. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So 
I think – so at least Michael – it seems to me he sent us an email and I'm actually he's going to interview me for one of his studies, but he suggested that he is talking about how the way we analyze media are the result of the specific time period that it was written in. And I don't want to go into this too much, but for a long time, I've been searching for a term that explains the phenomenon of like, let's say you watch Idiocracy today versus mm. 10 years ago. It affects us differently now. What's the term yeah. for that? I don't know if this is the right term, but I think that whatever I'm looking mm. for is a phenomenon that I think is relevant to the way at least I consumed this movie on this most recent viewing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like it's like a different season or a different age, so it, it could it it would be a more different zeitgeist, um, right? Yeah, zeit zeitgeist. Yeah, mm. yeah, it's more applicable than than Kronos would be for sure. Okay. Anyway, let's go into a recap. So, 40-year-old virgin Andy is invited to poker night by his co-workers, where they collectively decide it's their mission to get Andy laid for the first time. After a disastrous encounter with a drunk girl, Andy meets Trish, a single mom who runs a business across the street. Through the coaching advice of his friends, Andy is coaxed into trying male waxing, pickup tricks, speed dating, and even a prostitute. All efforts are fruitless, so he takes matters into his own hands and asks out Trish. The date goes well, but Andy's inexperience, coupled with an unexpected intrusion from Trish's daughter, keeps them from having sex. So on the next date, they decide not to have sex until they've had 20 dates. When the 20th date comes around, Andy gets cold feet, alienating Trish and creating a schism in their relationship. That night, Andy gets blackout drunk and goes home with the girl from the bookstore. Once he realizes she's a freak, Andy runs back to Trish and confesses that he's a virgin. She's fine with it, they get married, and Andy finally has sex for the first time, which inspires him to bust out into a song from Hair. End of movie. <laughs> there, now, it's funny that this is a comedy that's two hours and 15 minutes long. Yeah, and fuck yeah. Jed Apatow. God. Dude, I mean, he, you think this is bad? It got even worse with This is 40 and the whatever the Adam Sandler one was. Oh, yeah. It continued. Uh, I, would, right. I would make funny a note. People. About funny people, yeah. My uh, experience with this movie is it has been tainted be because This is 40 is one of my top five least favorite movies that's ever been made. Like, You know, I never it saw it because, because of the way you described it, I think I just couldn't handle watching it. Have you seen it, Lily? I have, yeah. And I agree. I mean, I wouldn't say it's excruciating. So me, long, though, you know. It, it is, yeah, but it, I Two feel like half. it could have lost an hour and a half and been a lot better. Um, yeah, it, it's problematic. Anyway, continue, Jared. <laughs> That's Austin's word. No, <laughs> it's for everyone. I felt like I had to give an ode. Yeah, By the yeah. way, have you seen Idiocracy recently? Because I watched it uh, for the first time since it first came out like six months ago, and it was an amazing experience. I, exactly. The experience was different. You know, I haven't, but the movie for me that I, that actually Ryan and I and Alec, another guy who works with us, we watched it like four months ago, and it was a completely different experience was Network. Watching oh, Network yeah. now Ooh, is fucking crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so the first question I want to open this discussion up of is what do we think of Andy? And what I want to specifically point to here is that at the beginning of the movie, I feel like we're, we're laughing at him quite a bit. Like the comedy only works, at least for the bulk of the first half of the movie, if we also buy into this idea that he's a super weirdo for being a virgin at 40. And mm. and I'm wondering, do you guys, having watched it now versus back then, like, did you find yourself reevaluating that? Like, you know, for example, there's a line. I didn't get that, though. I mean, to, to me, it's not that he's weird that he's a, a, a virgin. It's that you see all these quirks of his and it's like that kind of makes sense that he's a virgin because it's like everything that he does it's yeah. weird you're like mm -hmm. you're like all right that just adds to it i came to a movie called the 40 year old virgin this makes sense that this guy's a virgin because you know see i disagree i think that at the beginning of the movie we see that a beautiful woman comes up to Carell and asks what's the difference between i don't remember what she says like super 8 or betamax and he says, I'm not a salesman. And then Jay comes in and swoops in and starts macking on her. And I think the perspective of the film is that, like, Andy is the stooge. He's the he's the stooge for not hitting on this girl when there's a clear opportunity. And, right. mm -hmm. and exactly. Then, and, and then, like, later when Seth Rogen's character is talking about that he just went over the weekend to Mexico to watch a donkey show and, you know, Steve Carell only ate egg salad. Like, I think <laughs> we're – the only he reason – He didn't need it. He just made it. Or right, yeah, he, he like, just I'm made really it. Really excited about going home to make that Excel sandwich. <laughs> I, I feel like that joke only works if we're if we think like, oh yeah, Seth Rogen is kind of the normal one, and mm. and Steve Carell is the weirdo. 
At, I didn't think yeah, of him as a weirdo, though. I thought of him yeah. as a nerd. What's fascinating to me watching it now that I didn't get in 2005 was, like, how much the things that he that were prescribed as nerdy to him are now totally normal, like yes. liking yeah. comic books. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's normal <laughs> having comic book figures. Riding a bike, he's mocked for riding a bike. And I'm like, how many people now ride a bike? It's seen as like a hipster cool thing to do. Right. That guy would be getting laid all the time There's, if he was exactly. in his 20s now. <laughs> like, like, you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint. You're sexy and exactly. conscious. <laughs> right. And then there's one line that we're, that like I remember we laughed at back in 2005 and it's, I play poker online sometimes. Like, yeah. like that was yeah. super. Like, that's like, oh man, only weirdos yeah. play poker online. <laughs> now you're fucking yeah. cool. But now, like, that's where probably most poker is played. But you're right. I do yeah. think we were set up to laugh at him. But as a nerd, more so than a weirdo, I think the nerd thing was really played up. Even, I think some of the opening shots are him with a boner and peeing. Like right. he can't. Like it just he's supposed to be someone who is really repressed and really nerdy and kind of just internally having all these thoughts but can't convey them to anyone else. But like even yeah, the these is yeah, very relatable. Go ahead well, Austin. He is I, I was going to say that that to me is actually maybe the the start of where I found uh, it to be a bit problematic is that the, the ultimate Ding. joke at the end is right is that everybody else uh, that this film is that he's in a state of arrested development everybody kind of has some sort of form of stunted growth you know you got the mm -hmm. dude that's cheating on his girl you got the guy who's like this lovesick puppy that's suffering from like auto uh, uh, erot what is it uh, erotomania where it's like he was in love with Mindy but uh, you know they, they were dating for like four months but he's like obsessed with her and then you got Seth Rogen who's kind of like a stoner quote unquote loser guy but the, none of them are adults really right but at the end yeah. supposedly Steve Carell becomes a real adult because he really understands what it means to to be an adult and it's to have like a committed relationship with somebody and so there's this like you can tell that Judd Apatow who's you know he seems like he's a he's trying to live like the good platonic or not platonic but the good um american dream kind of uh nuclear family thing right with his wife who's also in the film again who's fucking hilarious um and the kids and stuff like, like that and so that's like the moral of the story right that he becomes the good adult he finally learns what it really means to grow up and be a man it's not just about putting the pussy on a pedestal and chasing <laughs> tail but it, you know it's about well, really becoming someone who connects with somebody yeah, connect and which emotional. i think is just hokey and corny but um <laughs> but beyond that the only reason that that, that trajectory works is because, like you guys have been saying, is that we're supposed to kind of buy into the idea that he's al he's already kind of a freak in terms of the way that we look at things, right? Culture looks at us like, oh, we're supposed to chase tail and we're supposed to go out and get laid and we have like these animal passions and that that's like that that's like normal, but it shouldn't be normal. And so that's where the tension and the humor comes in. And I think that that's kind of just like. I don't know. It's a, it sets up a really weird, like conservative paradigm that I just kind of think. I mean, <clears> see, it's funny I, you say I conservative know, because I would almost say that it's the opposite. It's it's like you know completely saturated in like you know hookup culture. Imagine just just, look, just think of the title of this movie. Mm -hmm. You know that the forty year old virgin. I suppose we're meant to believe it's a comedy because nothing is more ridiculous than a man who is forty years old and he's still a virgin. Can you imagine? Uh, being a 25-year-old kid or a 20-year-old kid watching this movie, being a virgin, and then seeing all this comedy and saying to yourself, like, shit, yeah. I better, I like, I've got fucking 15 years before, I better get, I better They're get, the, make I better a movie get, about me. I gotta better get this exactly. shit on lock, or I am literally, or I am literally, like, the subject of, like, cultural lampoonery. Like, being mm -hmm. a virgin at 40 is so abnormal, is so pathetic, that it's the joke of an entire two and a half hour movie that revolutionized comedy, <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and this is where I, and this is where I thought of the incel thing because like, it's this kind of cultural pressure that makes, that compounds the frustration of these incels. Like if you're an incel, if you're 25 and you haven't had sex, which I, I would imagine is probably pretty tragically common these days. Mm -hmm. Like, and you see a movie in which the whole joke is that a man can't get laid before he's 40. Man, your frustration is going to feel even worse because now not only are you unfulfilled sexually, but you're the about to be the joke of a whole society. Yeah, so uh, I, I I don't know why I did this to myself, but after I watched this, I decided to go down the uh, MGTOW incel rabbit hole a little bit <laughs> online and see what and see what they said about the movie Forty Year Old Virgin. And mm. I'll just give you just like a little snapshot of the general thrust. Oh the baby, general oh, right. thrust, oh baby. The general thrust was. 
man, this movie just totally fucking got it wrong. This guy had totally MGTOW down, which is men going their own way. He had his own MGTOW palace with video games and comic books, and then they brought this girl in to disrupt everything. So the common wow. thread was, the common thread was, is that this guy was doing his own thing. He was going his own way. He was totally happy. He was in a state of maybe naive bliss, but the film totally ruined it by imposing again that cultural standard that you need a woman in order to be satisfied. That is he was actually totally actually. satisfied before. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that is fascinating. I it's funny. That's like the most post structuralist take on the 40. There's more more of whatever that Yeah, yeah this made. is amazing. Like um, <laughs> if this movie was remade today, it would end differently. It would be like, no, fuck you, Catherine Keener. I'm going back to my toys. <laughs> well, okay. I, you I, think so, really? I, I well, think there's if, a very. Um, I, I wouldn't say that you know most of our culture, but I'm saying that there is a cultural movement that would suggest mm -hmm. that that would be the optimized thing to do. I, I mm -hmm. see what exactly y'all are saying, but I think the most important scene that, uh, that makes this not so is that you know the the scene when they're all playing poker, and then he has that whole monologue talking about you know like. I, you know, about his sex life throughout the years, you know, and how how uh, he couldn't talk to people. Was you weird. did get shy, Ryan. Were you about to say something explicit, and then you censored yourself? <laughs> no, I, I didn't. Talk about <laughs> boobs like bags of sand. <laughs> yeah. No. Come on, Lily. You take over the raunchiness. Exactly. <laughs> it's your turn. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so he was very insecure, basically. About it's it's way less about his sex life and way more because to him that's not as big of a deal as everyone else is, like y'all yeah. were saying. But but for him it's way more just he can't talk to girls you know and, mm -hmm. and and that's always been the issue and at some point he gave up and he admits that and kind of you can see in his face that he doesn't like think that that's a necessarily a good thing it's more the giving up talking to people that's the issue for him which you know in the end and then yeah he just how he just he has sex and that's like the cherry on top at the end he's basically well, it's interesting i'm sorry go no ahead. no no you go with lily that um, we know what Austin was talking about. I see like at the end of the movie that actually in many ways the moral for me is that he he was okay and that everyone else around him realized Andy was okay, that they were the ones who were making yeah. him out to be some kind of freak. And I mean, I even think about at one point, I think Seth Rogen's character tells him, he's like, don't let them like tell you all this shit because it's, it's not really what love is and you just like, don't worry about it. And yeah. like they all slowly come to realize that he is far more normal and healthy. Than they <laughs> right. are They're all way the more fucked up than him. Mm -hmm. So, Lily, I agree with what you're saying. I think by the end of the movie, we are meant to believe that Jay, or I'm sorry, not Jay, that uh, Steve Carell's character is the healthier one. But the thing that I find interesting is that the first half of the movie is only funny, or at least certain jokes are only funny, if we share that cultural disposition that he's not mm -hmm, the normal right. one. So when a, when a character like Seth Rogen makes a joke about, hey, I'm pretty sure that Steve Carell's character is a psycho killer and he's going to turn one of us into a lampshade, you know, that's only funny if we as an audience say to ourselves, yes, because 40-year-old virgins are, like, you know, so questionable and weird like that that I would laugh along with that. No, it's just, like, that guy in particular, you know, you see him and he's commenting on that guy. I don't think it's as deep as, like... Because he's, he's an introvert. It wasn't just that he was a virgin. I mean, in the store they all worked at, he wouldn't really participate in, like, jokes and he was always making weird comments, like, about going home and make an egg sandwich, you know? <laughs> right. Like, what are you doing this weekend? Well, I'm really looking forward to that egg sandwich. You know, like, people are freaked out by that. I think that's more so, personality. I mean, thing yeah, exactly. Yeah. I agree. I can see that. Yeah, But, but, but again, we, I mean, we are supposed to think that he's a loser, and that's how it's set up, right? Mm -hmm. And And I think that's what's so powerful, is that's where... The humor comes from he's not a bro like he doesn't know how to bro down with everybody else because he's not normal he's abnormal and so that's where i think jared's talking about and i right. do agree with jared on this and actually i do think lily that's an interesting take at the end i do think there's an element of that that, that is true but i think that at first the humor gets set up by the fact of first abnormalizing him he doesn't get laid or he can't get laid because he's a loser and that's how it's initially set up. And then you understand, oh, he's not a loser. He's just like a lovable, socially awkward kind of nerd. Mm -hmm. But still, he's still a loser, but he's an, he's an empathetic loser. And I think that's where the tension and the humor gets set up. Um, well, well and, but and, you know, set, up is the, set up is the key word, though, because, I mean, this movie does lure you in with that. And then it totally reverses it at the end. Like all the things you were laughing at at the beginning, you aren't mm -hmm. laughing at at the end. I mean, so to me, that's kind of a genius Maybe. structural thing as opposed to like a problematic beginning, you know. I'll say I mean, this. Like from, I'll, from, I'll, from a I'll, writing perspective, yeah.
it's it's really well crafted as a script, you know, and yeah. that I enjoy the improv bits and stuff like that. But I think as a at, at, at just like a plot level, I think it's actually really fucking funny and it's handled really well. Yeah, obviously because it's got all the payoffs and shit like that. I'll go ahead and be very honest about uh, my state in life. When I saw this movie for the first time, I was a sophomore in high school and I was a virgin. And like, I, you know, when at least for the first half of this movie, when you're laughing along with the movie, there is this instilled idea that like, I I can laugh with this because there's no way I'm going to be a virgin when I'm 40. You know what I'm saying? And like that, I think. To, uh, I mean, I hate like I hate being offended. Like I try as hard as I can not to be, and I wouldn't say this offends me, but I can kind of see what Aust- where Austin is coming from while saying that's problematic. Because imagine if, you know, not that this was like a defining cultural experience for me, but if my life ended up continuing to have like zero intimate success, like I think the fact that I know that this movie, you know, suggests that that's like the ultimate abnormality or and extreme abnormality like that would only compound my anger at the fact that i'm 40 year olds i'm 40 years old and a virgin mm. right and yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, i think i told you guys that i was i was uh recently on one of the other podcasts that i host i was watching the last picture show and talking so about good. it right and ryan you said you love that movie too love yeah. the fuck out of it L- lily have you seen the last picture <laughs> yes, show? yes no i love it okay people who haven't seen the last picture show see it it's a damn masterpiece but um, the thing that I thought was so interesting, again, in watching The 40-Year-Old Virgin was I was thinking, obviously, the incel stuff and incel culture. But I really was just thinking kind of more broadly about the way that, like, we view sex as being this important thing that uh, that it's built up. You know, like like they were saying, you do put pussy on the pedestal as a teenage boy, right? You are taught mm-hmm. that, like, you got to get laid if you're going to be a man, you know? And all your friends, that's what you guys talk about when you're 16. Or even if you're not talking about it, then you're not talking about it is actually, like, a lack within a paradigm by which you're supposed to be talking about it and you feel the fact that you're not talking about it as being a lack you know and like to get psychoanalytical there so it's like the desire is produced by the other system that is like imposing itself on you and I was thinking about this in relation to the last picture show and one of the things that's so interesting is again you see that tension in that film as well right Mm. where you have these young people that they think that getting married and having sex and uh there's that performance bit when jeff bridges and sybil shepherd are in the motel room and he can't get it up and then they're like but don't you go out there and you know and act like we didn't do it you better put on the smiling face and then Mm -hmm. all her friends come in they're like how was it and she's like it was unexplainable or whatever the fuck she says right <laughs> mm-hmm. and literally it's like, i can't explain it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly because it didn't happen um but uh there's this strange thing that somehow it's like a rite of passage mm. within certain cultures like maybe western culture in particular at least that's under this particular pressure of the the sexual paradigm that you aren't a human unless you're having sex and then we think that's it right you think like man once i have sex i'm gonna go from like there's gonna be the before sex austin and then the after sex Austin and after sex Austin is going to view the world in color as opposed to black and white and then you have (laughs) sex and it's kind of like oh that's just like a thing like it's not really that special like like yeah intimacy can be special and it can be deep and connective but Mm -hmm. in terms of just the act like it's just like a thing like it didn't like transpose me into this higher realm of consciousness or something like did that. it make you want to sing age of aquarius <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> yes i did as a matter of fact and, <laughs> i did the um, first time i had sex i don't know about you yeah. i still do as a matter of fact um so. <laughs> that would be so odd if you just started singing that song for sex. <laughs> you know what uh i'm putting it on my to-do list it's but, uh, the next time uh it happens when i'm out of my stage of voluntary celibacy i will I will get into that. <laughs> Austin, do you think that though that, that 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 this is a reflection of like the 2005 time period and stuff, uh, or because t- to me it just is like hasn't sex being a coming of age thing but just been the history Always of human case. human yeah. beings, you know, like well, ever I, since we can all talk, know. you know? Well, uh, right, but I guess, I guess that's the point. If you were to say that most people come of age at you know like in their late teens. Uh, but I think that's kind of more to the point. If we're saying that this forty-year-old man has not come to come of age yet, then I don't know. Someone in the audience is like, "Shit, I'm not going to be a man until I." But it's an indictment of that ultimately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it? Is it? it though? Is, it's admitting it at the end. It's like we all relate to that. Like we've all been in that situation. Where we're like, "Oh, am I a man enough?" Or whatever. You know what I mean? But then, like at the but then 
at the end, it's like, well, fuck all that, you know, like, like, like he found it when he found it and he's 40 and, uh, uh, and all the people that, that were fucking all their lives hunting for sex, you know, those guys are idiots. <laughs> I mean, I also think that they're not the idiots movie... though. They're fine. What do you mean? No, they're not. They're, 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 they're all like, uh, 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 Paul Rudd is going through his shit. You know, no, but all... he, he finds the, uh, the coworker chick. Right, ultimately, but I'm just saying that their mentality at the beginning of the movie. So they bond over being crazy ass people to their exes. Yeah, exactly. Well, but but it's but even yeah, then, they, it's like they bond over having previous relationship experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I think yeah. is really. I think you know people do that. That's I think the point of that. it though, for me, is it's fascinating. The older I get and I watch this movie, the more I think about it not being about sex, but instead about how we stop ourselves from doing things that we're afraid of doing, which we're afraid of for whatever mm-hmm. reason. Like maybe we were scarred by the time that we tried to dance in public and people made fun of mm-hmm. us. And so we're like, we're never dancing again. Right. You know, like all of the different things. And I think about my own life and times where I've stopped myself from doing things out of fear. And to me, it feels more about that than really even about sex that he just was so traumatized by the shame of not being good at the thing he was supposed to naturally be good at. And having women embarrass him, but then he automatically was like, I'm just not going to do this thing because I can't go through that again. I can't go through this really deep shame. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I you're absolutely right. That. And I wonder, do you think the film sets it up that the first encounter when he's getting a blowjob from his high school girlfriend and he gets, like, cut up from her braces, do you think they set it up that that's the traumatic moment? <laughs> or do you think, like, and, I mean, and that then, and then that's his qualifying <laughs> life event? Yeah, yeah, and then everything kind of came out of that, like that level that raised his level of anxiety, and so then all future sexual encounters were always going to be a bit I awkward think, because of that. I think you might have or watched the director's cut. When he hit the girl with his foot, <laughs> because then that's like that was the last time. Right up until that point, he was still trying, mm, and then he was okay. just like, "Oh my god, I've caused myself injury." And I've, she told uh, him you know, to stop trying. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and and then oh, he that's was right. like, "That's it." Does. That's it. I think more than a traumatic experience is really just the amount of time that has gone by, you know, like what and I, and I think like more, he says at the poker table. Right. Yeah. I think that mm-hmm. it's like, it, it, yeah, because after so much time has gone by and so many of your efforts are thwarted and, you know, you just don't see it naturally happening. Whereas with people like the Jays, like the Seth Rogen's characters, you know, it's like they very seemingly naturally. And I think that's one of the more interesting parts of the movie is when Jay reveals to him, it's like, look. I'm very well groomed. I don't just wake up looking like this. Yeah. You know, hey, and, yeah. Um, an but, <clears throat> but yeah, like part of the reason why people find themselves wanting to quit is because it seems like everyone else is doing it so effortlessly. And certainly some things mm-hmm. come easier to some to uh, pe- some people than others. But <clears throat> that's why Seth Rogen's character is so good. That conversation where he says, that, like, look, I don't look like an attractive guy, but, you know, yeah. I offset that by, you know, being able to talk to people, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, you know, for all the ugly virgins out there they can go well shit i could do that well you there's know. something See, to that something... idea of time too because what you're talking about there is he let so much time pass since that last incident where he he tried to he had his foot sucked and he hit this girl <laughs> that like he's now terrified even more so than if he had maybe a week later gone out with another girl and tried again like so much of rejection and getting over fear is just keep trying until it works and you no longer feel scared and i think he yeah. he let so much time pass that it just seemed insurmountable so there's yeah, a, I mean, there, go ahead, Jared. I was actually going to slightly change the subject, so you go ahead, Austin. Well, I was going to say I think this is just the thing that is so so interesting to me is that the whole film revolves around this idea of societal pressure. You know, Ryan asked earlier, like, is this just not something that has always existed? You know, coming of age, but coming of age hasn't existed through the lens of you have to like have sex because I think, wait, I think this wait, is I think a really so. weird. In see, cinema, definitely. I'm not, no, in, yeah, in, 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 civil, in old civilizations. Yes. In, in, <laughs> Actually, in my civilization, I, I get bar mitzvah, thank you. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and, and then you're a man. But no, right. that's it, rites of passage. Sometimes it's like sticking your hand. I can't remember what tribe it is, but they put these fucking fire ants into a basket, and you're supposed to stick your hand in there, and if they and they bite the shit out of your hand, and you don't make a noise, and that's your, that's your being welcome. Or the walkabout over there where you are. Right, exactly. So I don't know that it was always about sex and the way that we view it. I think this is a very particular post-Christian perverse understanding of the body that we've kind of like (laughs) we're trying to, 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 to deal with, right? Like sex was viewed as bad for so long 
or um, like they talked about an eyes wide shut, right? Before uh, in, in the days of the past or something, when when the Hungarian guy is dancing with Nicole Kidman, right? He says mm-hmm. uh, he's like, oh, women used to get married in the past so that they could lose their virginity, so that mm-hmm. because it was a taboo, women weren't allowed to to be sexually positive, right, or sex positive as we think today. They weren't allowed to be in control of their own agency over over sexuality, and so I think there's this weird like there's this weird reaction but there's still like this um lingering or hovering tension of like the christian guilt of sex is a thing that only operates under certain parameters and it's bad and it's dirty and it's weird and it's like transcendently metaphysically special and i think that that's hovering over this whole film and i'll be honest and i don't want to sound like some sort of wanky sex lib guru but like I just don't think sex is that special. Like, I don't think it's like metaphysically special. They talk about that, that, though, in the movie. That's mm-hmm. not putting the pussy yeah, on a pedestal. pedestal. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But nevertheless, everyone is still putting either the pussy or the phallus on a pedestal. Like, that's <laughs> well, the whole thing. I think they're just saying you got to do it at least once. Fuck. You know but when they mean? say don't put the, don't put the pussy on the pedestal, yeah, they're saying like you're trying too hard. You're worshiping it or something. They're not saying. Like, let's get away from these culturally constructed fears of sexuality based on a repressive. Rel- That's not what they're saying. No, you know, they're, they're saying they're like trying to, it's not going to head. It's not a, a transcendental them. experience, exactly. like you were Fucking saying. But, they, but the but the the dude but characters treat it like that. I mean, like Jay Absolutely. and all like that's what they talk about during poker. It seems their entire weekend life is about you know hooking up with chicks and like it. it I mean, that's. You know, these guys are meant to be like every man bro characters. And it, I, I think like the movie is just constructed in a way it's like, yes, these people, this is normal male culture. You know, the way that uh, Jay uh, talks about, he like talks about preying on junk chicks, drunk chicks. He's like, you know, it's a written code in his DNA that says tackle a gazelle. <laughs> and believe it or not, every man, there's a code that says tackle drunk bitches. Now, granted, Steve Carell does disagree with this. And ultimately, that that perspective is you know pretty deemed in a and they do make a point of saying the one woman she's too drunk because she's passed out. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> like, yeah, no, that was no, too drunk, too drunk. Right, that was the, but yeah. but but I think that once again, yeah, it's like you know we have the outcast and the normal people, and the normal people are the ones that are like, yeah, man, like sex is so important that you got to be a lion chasing a gazelle to get it. I, I do think that this right. movie I mean, it's still it still hovers though as like a weird religious god, you know, and and they respond differently. But the fact is that it's still like a looming figure. I'm sorry, go ahead. It's Pat. just funny that that you think that this is, has some sort of conservative type message. When I feel like this movie kind of jump started the, the its box office success is indication of like it, it jump started like the normalized hedonism in these R rated mm-hmm. gross right. out so comedy that's, movies. That's you know? how I would interpret it. Yeah, and, I was also almost thinking about posing the the question to Austin as a lapsed Christian. How do you feel about this kind of just completely like discarding christian morality yeah so the weird thing is is i think it's ultimately reactionary which i think is a conservative response rather than being sort of when i said earlier that like sex isn't special i don't mean it in like this animals do it it's like in our dna bro it's like the most basic thing man let's all just fuck come on with like the bro like dude thing that's trying to get a girl in bed that's not what i mean um i mean it more in the sense of like I think there is a way of kind of in a Nietzschean sense that we can we can reevaluate the reasons that we value everything in a in a post Christian or post God landscape. And even if you are still within a Christian paradigm or a religious paradigm, you can still view things from within a, a system that aren't overly determined by the way that that particular religious system tells you things ought to be valued. And I think that even the reaction against Christian morality that you might see in like this dude bro type of comedy that that is sort of like a a, a, a trying to get away from obviously Seth Rogen, Judd Apatow, they're Jewish, so they're not uh, Christians and they're explicitly Jewish in, in a lot of their uh, the way that they kind of orient things like what was that movie that they did? Uh, that Seth Rogen Sausage did. party? Well, I mean, another well, thing one. is it, every <laughs> every Seth Rogen role, he's always talking about like, yeah, I smoke weed with my rabbi or whatever. You know, right. it's always yeah. it's exactly. always there. Yeah, but but it, so it's not it's not that they're somehow like breaking free from these confines and experiencing true radical freedom in sexual liberation. I think it's really again it's still caught up in this ultimate 
paradigm that like sex is viewed in a particular way that it's meant for a particular thing or it's not for a particular thing or it's meant for the marriage room or that that's like the heights of real connection is is when you're in a relationship with somebody and you can really connect with them at this deeper level and i sound like such an asshole or like a cynic right <laughs> no, now no i i hear what you're saying doesn't exist whether and i don't mean that but i feel like it's a reaction to that which is still right. conservative it's still reactionary and i would want to be more transformative and productive in the way that we experience sexuality and that's why in our what would that look video like? room, i said this whole movie is about well so like tantra is i think an interesting way of experiencing uh pleasure that is in a, in a completely non like having sex for 12 hours right? well i mean yeah that that is that is part of it but it's less about it's less about that that's more instrumental right it's okay. not just you don't have sex so that you can like reach a level it's more about uh kind of trying to to get in touch with different chakras in your body or different levels of pleasure or different um, experiences of spirituality or materiality through the medium of the world. And sex is just one of the outlets. But in Tantra in particular, the reason that it can be transformative is because the power dynamic shifts from instead of it being male-led and about the male orgasm, which I think most Western sex is about, uh, it's about female power and um, female orgasm or female pleasure more than just orgasm. And so in Tantra, they talk about the ingasm rather than the orgasm. So it isn't about like <laughs> ejaculation, but it's about the sort of like deep ingasm that you can have. That's a full body thing that they say is, quote unquote, much more akin to a woman orgasm. But I mean, how can you really compare the two? But but still, it's it's about experiencing these different types of sex that aren't just about like male ejaculation. And I think this film is still about male ejaculation, which I think is ultimately what, I, what I'm trying to get at. So before we move on, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, that should have been the tagline, definitely. <laughs> all right, I like it just swiftly. Um, all right, so moving on to the next topic. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so before we move on, uh, one thing I want to so. Uh, more to Austin's point, there was one scene that I found particularly interesting. Uh, to Austin's point about how sex is uh, so essential to our society, there's a line where somebody tells Andy, "Sex should be the last thing on your mind." Sex should be the last thing on your mind. And then it cuts to Andy walking down the street, and he's assaulted <laughs> by sexual I imagery know. in real life, in the media, in advertisements, down the street. It's an odd scene that I think is ultimately just—it's just trying to be a joke on how he can't stop he can't escape thinking about sex but in a weird way i think it ends up making a commentary on how this importance of sex is instilled in all these social elements mm -hmm. in media in advertising you know that's also an element that makes whether it be making uh, steve carell think that sex is important or his other dude friends you know sex is everywhere yeah yeah it's because of this like ubiquitous representation of sex that he feels pressure to be more like the people who are quote unquote right, which are the man whores, you know? I like that more that he just saw sex everywhere. Well, that's like, what it's meant to be. I'm just right. overthinking. I know, but yeah. <laughs> Can I also I mean, ask, do any... Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Lily. Go um, Lily. Do any of you guys view the fact that he in, in many ways is playing the traditional woman's role? I mean, he's a, he's kind of a romantic. I mean, we know that he obviously has had all these traumatic incidents which have stopped him from continuing to try to have sex for many years. But when he starts to have the opportunities to have sex, he's, he turns women down. And in many ways, I think about the scene where he finally tells Catherine Keener's character that he is a virgin. He re realizes this whole time, he says that kind of romantic, potentially sentimental trite line, this whole time I've just been waiting for you. I, I yeah. feel like in romantic comedies, mm. women could be definitely in that role and women are often the ones who are waiting for the special someone to not just necessarily have sex with or lose their virginity to but just even to be in relationship with and i think andy's also a romantic he's not just definitely this nerdy freak he's also really genuinely believes in romance he finds it hard to watch porn because he can't really think about this being a realistic romantic place for him yeah i think that's accurate although i would i'm a little torn on the one hand i think your reading is probably the most correct but on the other hand i really think it's just kind of ultimately all about fear it's not that mm -hmm. it's not that he doesn't have desires it's not that he doesn't have desires that he'd like to be fulfilled but he's just so afraid of humiliation that yes, uh definitely. you know like like it, it's over it, it's outweighing any effort he would you know like yeah sex might be great but man i've been down that road before and if i get rejected or I, if i get humiliated it's going to be so painful and so he just wants to and avoid the pain. That's primal thing, right? For any of us, I mean, I know I've been humiliated before, and, like, my first reaction is never again. I don't ever want to feel that again. Yeah. It's right. a deep, deep, profound impact that it leaves. Yeah. 
I was going to say, the bit when he's walking down the street, it reminded me of, remember that cheesy movie with Josh Hartnett called, like, what was it, 40, oh, 40 Days, days and 40 Nights? nights. Because it was sex for Lent. Well, masturbation yeah. for That's Lent. another great Lent. example yeah. of what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, and, and, like, remember he, like, he like goes out and everywhere it's, like, the, the chicks are topless when he's walking yeah, out because totally. he just can't get it off mm-hmm. of his mind. That, that scene kind of reminded me of this. And they probably came out around a similar time, didn't they? Yeah, it's, like, a perfect one? another perfect example. Like, yeah. when I was a kid, I was like, oh, man, I can't wait till I'm Josh Hartnett's age and, you know, going 40 Days and 40 Nights Without Sex will be, like, you know, this really hard challenge, you know, because I'm just going to be getting laid so often like, you know, every normal person does. That's fucking yeah. bullshit, you know? <laughs> going out without sex 40 Days and 40 Nights is fucking normal for single people these days. Yeah, so, I mean, let's just be honest. Movies do not represent relationships or sex well. <laughs> yeah. No, All of exactly. us are probably really fucked up as a result of what we've learned from movies. Yeah, it is weird how, you know, if I, I watch... If, if I watch an action movie and there's a dude doing six backflips or whatever, yeah, some people can do six backflips, but I don't expect myself to do six backflips. But if I see a man who, uh, you know, has sex regularly and, you know, fulfills his desire with relative ease, for some reason, that is harder for me to, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, separate from my expectations in life. Do you guys feel that way? I mean, I think when you watch like – the Bourne movies or something like that, and you watch these fight scenes, it actually does affect the way that we view the fragility of the body. Like, we think, <laughs> oh, yeah, you can take all these punches and you can, like, mm-hmm. land on a car out of falling out of a two-story window and you can just limp away. No, motherfucker. You get punched <laughs> in the face, you go yeah. out. You punch somebody in the face, you break your hand. Like, I think I think films do affect the way that we think about it, and then I think sex is just another example of that, mm-hmm. you know? It's that, just more that sensitive that topic. At... I, I, yeah, I, mean, I, yeah. I hear what you're saying, Austin, but I guess, like... You know, so I love martial arts films, and when I was a kid, like, I, you know, I guess I was just more okay with knowing that I'll never be able to do a backflip in life than the idea that I'd ever, I'd never, you know, have regular sex, is basically what I'm saying. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but it's not regular sex. Films don't show regular sex. They show or or, or regular, like like often, sex often is what I meant. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. On a regular basis. (laughs) Right. <laughs> yeah but see again i think this is just so weird um so in psychoanalysis they talk about uh in lacanian psychoanalysis it's that desire is always desire of the other right so your desire isn't something that is intrinsic from within from drives or something like that but it's something that comes to you from being incorporated into the symbolic order you know the rules the laws the norms of society whatever um, and it has other more complex elements to it. But the point is, is that your desire is always externally determined, right? And it's like we talked about in our our Nolan 2 video with Rene Girard and mimetic desire. I want what the other person wants. Or I want what I want because the other person wants what I want. And so there's like this competition over it. And I think, again, these films only contribute to like intensifying this weird mimetic desire for what sex is and why we want it and how often we want it and under what conditions do we want it. And so I think it really kind of just creates this strange, weird, neurotic disposition towards sexuality. And I think this film kind of does that. I think that's ultimately why it was unsettling to me is that, and it's not the male gaze as is sometimes talked about in, in like film theory, but there is a sense in which this film is all filtered through. And I know Catherine Heigl criticized Judd Apatow for being like feminist, like the way that he portrays the difference between men and female characters. But there is something kind of skewed and limited about the way that this film understands or portrays sexuality that I think it does affect us. It's just one of the, the pieces in the chain that affect us. All right, so I want to make this a little bit more lighthearted. Let's just go around and what is the funniest moment, favorite moments, favorite characters. <laughs> Let's start with Lily. Um, for me, the funniest moment always is um, the kind of poker scene where Andy talks about what he thinks breasts feel like. Mm. I mean, I just love the way all of them are looking at him as he says, you know, like bags of sand in your hand. <laughs> yeah. It feels like a bag of sand when you're touching it. Bag of sand. It's just because the the reactions and his expression and also how Steve Carell is just so earnest in talking about it, and he's just trying to fit in. All of it, I love. I also do love Paul Rudd in this movie, and I love yeah. his hatred of Michael McDonald. Like, I just cannot <laughs> get enough of that any scene in the store, which is it supposed to be Circuit City? I'm assuming it's like Circuit City. I don't even know what um, it was supposed to be at the time or at Best Buy. But, you know, they have that damn DVD going all day long, and he's just going <laughs> ape shit listening to Michael McDonald. So any scene there makes me laugh. Yeah. What about you, Ryan? Um, I liked when uh, when... 
when Steve Carell asks like uh, Seth Rogen, like, "Hey, should I call her?" and then he goes, uh, "No, you wait for it to grow into a plant, and then you fuck the plant." Oh right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That line got me. Oh, should I have asked her out? No, no, that's the key. You wait for it to grow into a plant, and then you fuck the plant. Pretty hard. And then I really oh, love the moment when uh, when <laughs> the sweet moment when Steve Carell performs the magic trick with a big dime in the rubber ear, uh, you know, oh, for the kid. Yeah. And then the girl's like, the daughter's like, that means you walk around with a rubber ear in your pocket all day. Yeah, but that means that you walk around with a rubber ear in your pocket all day. Um, yeah, like half the time. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. about half the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. just that, that imagery of him walking around with a rubber ear is pretty great. Yeah. It is good. Hey, you yeah. got to be prepared. What about you, Austin? Um, so as much as I can get wanky and talk about how I think this film is problematic, I still laugh like a motherfucker when I'm watching this movie. It's so fucking like funny, it. man. And I mean, <laughs> it's like a, it's like a, I hate myself because I like it because then I feel guilty <laughs> and then I get into my philosophical like musings and I'm like, oh, is this film, you know, damaging to cultural, you know, relations, or whatever? Because I'm crazy. Um, but no, uh, it's because yeah, you care. I, I think, yeah, maybe. Um, so all of those parts I think are fantastic. I think the the bit for some reason that I laughed so much about last night was when he's fighting with the condoms. I don't know why I laughed so oh, hard. Yeah. It, but I, I think it's because <laughs> I've struggled with that shit, man. Like sometimes you're like, God damn it, I I've done this a thousand times before and I can't even do it. And then he just condoms know are the complicated. I love that that scene was included. I love it. I love the bit when he puts the magnum on his arm or he puts it over his balls. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck, man! It's so funny, and it, the weird thing is, I remember having conversations with my buddies in high school about that. We were like, "Wait, do you put the condom like over your balls? Like when you were like fourteen, fifteen? You were, like... <laughs> so I remember having Ouch. those conversations. <laughs> my favorite part. Uh, you don't, by the way. If there's anybody listening, that <laughs> no, don't, don't out, do it. <laughs> don't do that, please. My favorite part uh, is definitely the the scene between uh, Mooj and Jay. So Mooj is the uh, the Pakistani employee, oh, yeah. and um, <laughs> I just love how like they're at each other's throats, threatening each other with violence, calling each other variations of the N word. But then like at the end, he's like, "Yo, you're gonna take my sh- shift on Saturday." He's like, "You know it." And then they like then they like <laughs> high five and hug it out. Yeah. And oh god, like I'm when it comes to offensive humor, I am a hundred percent a Zizekian who believes, and he says that like you know. Like that kind of like racist humor or something like that, or like it, it, it's like intimacy through obscenity, and yeah. uh, mm. I, and even like when I make fun of Austin for his Twitter, like it's about that. It's about like showing fondness mm-hmm. of someone through obscenity, and I think that that's something that has been tragically lost today. And I think it's something that's super potent and very important, at least to me. And I thought also it was just funny; those two characters going at each other is hilarious. Yeah. yeah, it is, and, we, it, and it is kind of sweet how they hug it out. At yeah, the end exactly. Kind of throw it out you think these people hate about each the, other? The David Caruso scene. <laughs> when oh yeah. Seth Rogen tells oh, him yeah. to channel David Caruso, and it is so <laughs> creepy great. and yet effective. <laughs> David Caruso in Jade, yeah. and, and he knows exactly, exactly what he's talking about, <laughs> yeah. which is actually a great moment, just because Steve Carell's character is like such a nerd, <laughs> yeah. and he's seen like all these movies and all these TV shows, so he's like, "Oh, I got that," and then he just nails it. I exactly. mean, have you seen that? Yeah. I've never seen. I have not. Jade, but... I have seen it, and it's it is effective. It's kind of how Mickey Rourke was in pretty much every movie okay. <laughs> towards the eighties, the end of the eighties. You know, like Nine and a Half Weeks and Wild Orchid, which is this idea that David Caruso then stole from him. Really, I think Mickey Rourke might have been the mm. first one where you just are very direct and you repeat things like as a question. That someone that a woman says back to you, <laughs> okay. and oddly enough, it should be patronizing, but it ends up being sexy because of the men who are doing it. And so it's so funny to see that scene with Elizabeth Banks. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing that's so amazing about this movie too is a lot of times in comedies you don't get good acting, but this film is actually like everyone in this film is a good actor. Yeah. You know, yeah. as much as people want to bag on certain people for whatever reason, I was thinking of Seth Rogen in particular. But in terms of playing the role and being in the moment and being real, everyone's fantastic. And Steve Carell in particular, you can see why this film like launched him into stardom. He's fucking fantastic. Like yeah. his awkwardness and the way that I mean, he it is so cringy sometimes how uncomfortable he is and how socially mm-hmm. just unaware he is. And he handles it so well um i think it's well he wrote this movie something that i didn't remember yeah Yeah, you know watching it it yesterday yeah he co-wrote it but he came up with the character and i think it really was clear to him it's it's him in some ways Oh, what had he done before this? Do you know? he, he had he was on the daily show for forever and he Mm -hmm. was also on uh sctv 
Second City TV uh, with 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 you know Stephen Colbert and all them. Oh, so he's a Second City guy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense why he's a master improviser. And Ryan, you said you don't like the the sort of like Apatow improv shit. Why don't you like? I that? like all those people, honestly, and I like Judd Apatow. It's just like it's more of like a f- filmmaking thing, you know. Like the only people I think that can do it like fucking awesome and you'd never know is Will Ferrell basically and mm-hmm. and maybe like Danny McBride every once in a while but even Danny McBride like a lot of Eastbound uh, not Eastbound but uh, like Vice Principals and stuff because Eastbound's perfect but Vice Principals you know it feels like you can just mm-hmm. tell they kept the camera rolling for so many takes and then they're, mm-hmm. they're talented so it works out a lot of times but then sometimes when I notice it it takes me out so much that they're making a movie you know like a, mm-hmm. like usually I'm not you know my suspension of disbelief is pretty rock solid but but for this kind of stuff, I can usually tell. Like, all right, they just that was one of those takes. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. I see. I think Robin Williams was like. Oh yeah, he's. They a did a lot of stuff in it, right? Too, yeah. Like, like. Oh Good yeah. Vietnam. Is Aladdin is entirely improvised. Love. Did you know that? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It really was. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. Yeah. See, I think. See, I love that when someone is a master at it. Like, like Good Morning Vietnam is a movie that I love. But I was talking about it with a director friend of mine, and he said, I don't think it's actually a good movie. I think it's just a set piece for Robin Williams to right. be it Robin really Williams. Is. Yeah, the movie's mm-hmm. not that and, awesome. And it works because of that, you know. So, so sometimes it works. Um, but I guess I didn't. I didn't know that fucking Aladdin was totally improvised. Yeah, starring Robin Williams, co-starring Cocaine, um, <laughs> <laughs> and co-starring Gilbert Gottfried. Uh, one, so before we go into the mailbag, I just want to bring up one other thing that's more in line of us. Uh, you know what it's like to revisit a film in another time period, and that is. Stormy Daniels is in this movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. We didn't mention <laughs> yeah. that. Holy yeah. shit. I, I, yep. when, I, when I saw her, I was like, wait, is that? <laughs> and then I looked it up to IMDb. Yep. I mean, it is. Wow. Cool. Yeah, man. And then I was reminded of the tweet of uh, Seth Rogen saying that, like, yeah, she just told us about the Donald Trump thing like a decade ago. And it was like, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> oh, um, it was from this movie. Yeah. 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 Oh, because I saw that it came up on like my YouTube requested videos of Seth Rogen being interviewed, and I, I watched it, but I didn't know that it was from Forty Year Old Virgin. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. All coming together. Um, Lily, you, Lily, your podcast is called the the uh, the movie that changed me, right? This movie changed this me. This movie yeah. changed me. Is this movie a movie that changed you? <laughs> I actually would list it up there. Yeah, right. it made me really stop being so hard on myself, and. Um, and it, it was a real prompt for me to stop being afraid of things that I had been scared of in the past and had uh, kind of made me overcome experiences, um, particularly with dating. I think I found it hard often to go on the second and third date if the first date didn't go well. And I love the speed mm-hmm. dating scene that they actually yeah. show in the movie because I, I definitely related to that and did that multiple times. It's an awkward thing going on dates. And <laughs> I think that I appreciated that the movie was so just vulnerable about that. It is an awkward process. Dating, Amen. relationships, intimacy, how anybody manages to meet each other and make it work is just astounding to me. So I, I yeah, I do love this movie for that. The power of cinema. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Mailbag. All right. So this first question is from Alexander. Now, before we get into Alexander's uh, question, I want to remind everybody that you can send us an email at movies at wisecrack.co. That's C-O, not dot com. Uh, and also, right before we do this, I want to give a reminder to everyone, please give us a review on iTunes. It's a great thing to do. It feels great, and it helps us out. So if you have a couple minutes, give us one of those five-star reviews. Those are particularly good. Um, anyway, so Alexander says, I was listening to your podcast on Fargo, and I was surprised you didn't talk more about the role of Norm Gunderson. Hmm. Marge's husband is essentially in the same position as Jerry Lundegaard. He isn't the breadwinner of the family and is mainly supported by his wife, who works as the chief of police, something that would emasculate a lesser man like Jerry. Norm doesn't even seem to have a job. Yet this is the only recurring male character who is not reeking of toxic masculinity. He isn't emasculated by his financial dependency on his wife because there's no hierarchy in his marriage. He supports and provides for his wife in small ways, such as in making her breakfast, jumping her car, or surprising her with lunch. In the same way, she supports him. They are simply codependent couple working together. In contrast to Jerry Lundegaard, Jerry is completely focused on money and feels emasculated by the fact that he is financially reliant upon his wife and father-in-law. I think this is a really great point that Alexander brought up. I've never yeah. thought about that. Same. I yeah. love the, the last scene of the movie is so amazing, you know, when they're just sitting there in bed and, like, you know, she's seen all this 
you know, her job, you know, makes her see the worst parts of humanity. And then, yeah, Norm's just sitting there, like, what, making her, no, no, in bed or something? Yeah, or yeah. he's, uh, mm-hmm. they're talking about the two cent stamp that. Yeah, his, yeah, his exactly. Got. You know, I yeah. mean, it's just like, <laughs> um, it's an interesting dynamic they have. Yeah, I never really, it's interesting how Alexander was able to bring Norm's character into like a relevant context of Jerry's arc. I'd never really mm. thought of that, but I think that that's pretty, pretty insightful. Mm. Yep, yep, yep. Cool. This next one is from Andrew. He says, uh, this is about Eyes Wide Shut. He said, you guys argued a little about the state of the film when it was released. Was it Kubrick's own cut? I believe the answer is yes. The studio added the digital figures during the orgy scene only to satisfy a contractually obligated R rating. Those figures have since been removed, even in the version that's currently on Netflix, thank God. I've heard no other evidence of studio tampering. I think it's important to note, however, that all of Kubrick's other films, save for Barry Lyndon, clocks out, clocks in at about two hours, 20 minutes. 2001, The Shining, Clockwork Orange, and Full Metal Jacket are all approximately that long. Um, so this just goes more to, and actually we got a lot of comments, and I think that Eyes Wide Shut is a movie where it's particularly important to be skeptical about all the mythology and rumors going around mm-hmm. about it. Um, and most of the information that I know about the movie comes from books that seem to suggest that there's little evidence to th- suggest that there's like a missing 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Because this movie is caught up in all these like conspiracy theories about the Illuminati killing Stanley Kubrick, you know, and that's why there are 20 minutes left. It's so easy to get misinformed. <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, that Andrew is right here, but I just wanted to at least qualify why I was pretty certain that the idea that it was cut down was a myth. Mm. Interesting. All right. Uh, This next one is from Lucy. It's about Donnie Darko. Uh, She said, I wanted to address the famous, why are you wearing that stupid uh, human suit line? Unlike (laughs) you guys, I was much younger when the film came out, so I only came to watch it as an adult. I have never had the opportunity to watch it as a teenager. I never saw that line as anything but a jab at the whole suburban outlook of things that the movie stood shunning from the get-go. If it had been a foreshadowing of Donnie's costume, that's pretty cool, like Jared said, but I thought of it as a sort of everyone here wears a mask type of turn. Donnie seems to believe that everyone around him is not authentic, that they all wear some sort of mask for the sake of a society they construct, along with the mindless people like the Sparkle Motion or whatnot. Uh, But the whole point of it, I felt, is that Donnie himself has been folded, fooled into believing he's authentic, hence the stupid human suit, because he isn't authentic. He's wearing the I'm better than all of you banner with pride when in reality, he's exactly like every one of those poor souls navigating the quagmire of their society, the political climate, and their world, world, world problems. He's exactly like them and no better and no worse. What do you guys think about that? First of all, uh, quagmire, giggity. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, it's so weird. <laughs> when you hear the line out of context, it sounds like super wanky and try hard. Yeah. But I think for some reason it does actually work in the context. And I think that's a, that's an interesting point is that it is sort of getting to this idea of authenticity versus inauthenticity. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm down for it. I mean, I think in the context of the film, the line works, but... Who was it? Was it Jared or was it Ryan? That like Ryan, you liked it, right? But Jared, you thought it was wanky as well. Fuck. I think the the way that you just described it, wanky and try hard, is exactly very very good way. <laughs> I to, like to it put a lot it. because you know it's it, yeah. to, to me it's way less about authenticity and how you act and way more like you know this is like a very existential movie you know and it's kind mm-hmm. of like what makes your body so you know why is that normal like you know like how do you know you're not you know just an entity in a suit like it kind of brings up this kind of i don't know weird transcendental point well i would say that you know interestingly lucy says that that donnie is just as inauthentic as everyone else and i guess when i first started reading her email i thought she was going to say the opposite i thought she was going to say that the stupid man suit is the bunny guy basically saying like hey everyone else in your society wears a mask why don't you it's very comfortable but Mm -hmm. uh but I guess it could be easily – it could be taken either way. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I just say you guys have profoundly – like deep, profound listeners? I mean it's amazing. <laughs> Their oh. comments. Oh, thank you. Thank – well, don't thank me. Thank the ones – whatever. Anyway, so this last <laughs> I one – I agree. You guys are awesome <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, this last one is from Peter. 
And I know this is going to seem super wanky that I'm reading this, but he says, What does wanky him, mean in this context? <laughs> you're, you're about to see. <laughs> okay. I have to agree with Jared's assessment on Cabin in the Woods. Oh, <laughs> boo! <laughs> boo, Peter! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I need this, man. I got some hate for that. I want to go. I want to find uh, the... Uh, as enjoyable book. as it may be to indulge, that movie is about as personally engaging and mentally nourishing as wet cotton candy. <laughs> <laughs> Which also I love. My biggest issue with Cabin in the Woods is that it's a film that gets praise and gratification for poking fun at these senseless tropes of horror films, but does this through storytelling and film tropes that are in themselves senseless. The movie asks us to be critical of horror films while simultaneously demanding the viewer to stay in suspension of disbelief for the sake of its own plot. That's like part of the point, bro. The, the, di <laughs> the dialogue is the primary <laughs> source of exposition in the film. The characters and their actions aren't believable or relatable. And honestly, I don't think Cabin in the Woods does anything revolutionary for film. At best, it's a plot parody with a twist and mix of genre. So... All right, you guys disagree with Peter and myself. Peter, you're... Listen, you're... you can't be right all the time. Sometimes you're going to be wrong, <laughs> and this is one of those times yeah. where you guys hey, are I just wrong. I, I love you, Peter, Jared, uh, love you guys, but yeah, wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> um, Lily, what do you think about Cabin in the Woods? Team Jared all the way. Oh, fuck oh, yeah. What the hell? Hell? hell yeah. Thank you. All right, Lily, we can't be friends anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like going on a really fun roller coaster ride and feeling like, you know, that could have been different. Like, you had fun while you were watching it. You can't tell me you didn't have fun while you were watching that fucking movie. You're just nitpicking at after the fact, and you're like, you know, you just. Uh. I you know, said, I think I'll the say, problem was the Peter hype and Lily, you're not allowed at our it's, party. It's I'll party say it again. Too, me and Ryan. It's like going to a buffet. I like the buffet, but man, do I feel like shit afterwards. And I don't think I would go again. <laughs> See, I would just use that to describe like a Transformers movie where it's like, all right, that was awesome. Two and a half hours of mayhem. I felt I had so much fun while I watched it, but I'm not going to fucking remember or think about that ever again. So, you know, and then I'm this, Cabin in the Woods, I had so much fun and it was like, and then afterwards, I was like, wow, I, I wanted to think about that movie for days. See, you're underestimating how much of a douchebag I am. Oh. Because to me... <laughs> because to me, it's like when I go to a buffet and I eat too much, it's detrimental to my body, even though I enjoyed it. And when I watch Cabin in the Woods, I enjoy it, but I think it's detrimental to cinema. What? <laughs> You can't have a uh, you can't put the movie on the pedestal like Forty Year Old Virgin. The new, a movie is just one movie in all of movies. It doesn't change all of movies just because it exists. One movie can change the whole trajectory of cinema. Look at Star Wars. Look at Pulp Fiction. Don't tell me that if one movie doesn't have that power. I guess you're right in terms of box office. What? But no, in terms he's not of right, he, no, Jared, Jared is wrong. Oh yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> tell him, Austin. Why is you wrong? Because, man, it's too, we don't have enough time. We're going Yeah, over, yeah, we don't have enough is, time. He's wrong, but he is wrong, and that's all I'm going to say <laughs> over and over and over again, and I don't need to support myself. Ten the Woods for life. All right, that's it for the mailbag. <laughs> Reminder, email us at movies at wisecrack.co, but before we sign off, where can we find you guys on the internet? Let's start with Lily. Oh, you can find me. This is actually the only social media platform that I use is Twitter, so you can find me at L-I-L-M Percy. That's Lil M. Percy. Um, and uh, this movie, Change Me Podcast, which is TMCM Podcast on Twitter. Cool. And Ryan? Uh, you can find me, uh, you can find my game show, Ryan's Game Show, that I make in my garage uh, on YouTube or Facebook, or Ryan Shorts. And uh, we, we just released a film called The Man Behind the Man Behind the Muppets, where you can find <laughs> the true story behind Jim Henson. Mm. And Austin? And if you want to hate follow me like Jared does on Twitter, <laughs> I'm at Austin <laughs> underscore Hayden, H-A-Y-D-E-N. Cool. And uh, follow me at, at Wisecrack. I have an Instagram full of dog photos, at Father of Woody. You can follow me. Um, and I want to remind everybody to please check out Lily's podcast, This Movie Changed Me. We're going to put a link in the description. It's really great, really insightful. Um, I recommend listening to her episode on the movie Ordinary People because – I've never really had a conversation with anyone about that movie because it's even though it <laughs> even though it has a best picture Oscar behind its name, like no one ever talks about it and no one has seen it. So it was really refreshing to hear Lily's take on it. So definitely check that one out. It's a really awesome idea for a podcast too. I really oh, thank yeah, you. I like your I idea. Yeah, Steve is. Almond, um, who does the podcast Dear Sugars and has a New York Times column and is just this amazing writer on like male vulnerability. He's the person who talks about ordinary people and how that movie actually influenced him to talk about what being a man is and and um, toxic masculinity and and all those things. Yeah, that guy puts his uh, himself he puts himself on the line like he's he's opening his heart to the world, man. Good for him. What would your yeah. episode be, Jared? You know what it would be? Dark Knight, Matrix. It would be the Matrix. All right, yeah, yeah. Really, the first one. The first one. Yeah, the yeah. Matrix is the 
seeing the Matrix when I was 12 years old is pretty much the most significant life event <laughs> <laughs> in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it was epic. Be saved, saved by the bell. <laughs> up with Zach. And when she cheated on Zach, it was ruined it the my TV life, movie. Was that the the one? <laughs> it's all of it. The college years, the fucking time when they go to Hawaii, the, oh, yeah. all of it. What would yours be, Ryan? Army of Darkness, dude. Oh wow. Yeah. Wait, so oh. Lily, is is there one for you, like the ultimate one that changed you? No, I mean, I always when I use this example to book guests, I talk about Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Ooh, and yeah. um, and I talk about sleeps in Seattle to try to give examples. But um, but it's hard. I mean, there's there's so many things that you know movies change us with and on, and lessons we learn. So it, there's so many, including Forty Year Old Virgin for me. Yeah, cool. All right, well that's it for today. I want to thank Lily from the This Movie Changed Me podcast for joining us today. It was great having you, Lily. We got to do this again. Thank you. Yes, I love talking with you guys. Yeah, that was awesome. Cool. All right, well join us next week when we'll be covering. I don't know. I'll probably have to pick this up. So, um, so that's it for today, guys. See you next week. Peace. Goodbye from Hollywood, California. Laters. <laughs>